Hey there, listeners. Deboki and I were both gone for a couple weeks in October. I was in Greece. Deboki was traveling throughout Norway. So for this week's episode of Tiny Matters, we wanted to do something a little bit different and share a few things from our vacations with each other and with you. And of course, a lot of those things are through a scientific lens. Think of it as a little bit like our tiny show and tell, only it is the whole episode long and it is about our travels and the things we've seen and the ways that our brains just cannot shut off the science side of the things we're (laughs) interested in, even when we are on vacation and not supposed to be working. Yeah, sometimes a problem. So let's flip a coin to decide who kicks things off. Do you want heads or tails? I will go with heads. Okay, so if it lands on heads, then you get to decide if you go first or second. Cool. Heads it is. Um, I, I appreciate all this power. <laughs> How about you go first? I'm very excited to hear about your trip to Greece. So I got married at the beginning of October. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And then we went on a honeymoon to Greece. I'd never been before, had always wanted to go. So before I get into a few fun little science bits, I want to talk about Greece itself for just a second. So Greece is stunning. Taboki, you know that. You've been to Greece. Um, We actually, we only missed each other in Greece by like, four days, something like that? Yeah, something like that. I think it's it felt like as soon as I left Greece, you were finally like, I can go there now. Deboki's not there. <laughs> no. The country is mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so unfortunately, there was no time for a, a Tiny Matters collaboration internationally. But, you know, what can you do? <laughs> uh, we're talking about it now. So in Greece, I could not help thinking uh, very nerdily a little bit about Tiny Matters because There's so much cool Greek mythology that was really, you know, woven into the lives of people in Neolithic and ancient Greece, but also, I mean, today, right? So it made me think a lot about our conversation with Moya McTeer a few months ago Mm -hmm. and the mythology surrounding the Milky Way and sort of this linking of science and myth. Um, And also when we were, when I was in Greece, uh, we had episode 20 come out. um, And In that episode, we chatted with Emily Zarka, who mentioned that her favorite undead creature is the vampiric Frikolikos, which is from Greece. So I felt like I've been kind of dipping into some some Greece-related things unknowingly (laughs) leading up to my trip. Um, (laughs) I should also say that, you know, Greece has a very long, complex history. A lot has happened in Greece over many millennia, and everywhere you go, there's history. So, you know, you could even go into a hotel, and there will be this big cut out hole in the floor with plexiglass over it. And you'll look down onto ruins that were buried underground and people only found because hotels were starting construction. So in Greece, people are constantly building around history, preserving history, building around it. And there's just this ever present feeling of the past in a very cool way. I loved it. It's pretty, pretty obvious. Um, And also because where Greece is located in Europe, but is also so close to Africa, so close to the Middle East. There's this really interesting mixing of cultures, um, not just today, but, you know, for millennia. And so it was a big region for trade for thousands of years, which means you see little bits and pieces of other societies mixed into the artwork, buildings, and maybe even medicine. So this is kind of a little a little sciencey <laughs> tidbit that I thought was kind of fun. But in Crete, which is one of the islands we visited, which is south of mainland Greece, there's been at least one skeleton found where the skull, or I guess a skull, I don't I don't want to say a whole skeleton because it might just be the skull, found showing the healed marks of a surgery. So that it would indicate Ooh. a possible brain operation or at least some sort of like skull operation where the patient survived, and this was 200, sorry, 2200 to 1720 BCE, a really long time ago. Um, Man. Yeah. The thing that also, whenever I hear about like things we found like that, one of the things that I've been trying to think about more is the fact that like the fact that we found one skull like that 
it's not just like that's the one person who's ever had right. brain surgery done, right? Like there were other people probably. Yes. And we just somehow found one example of it. Just imagining what it, like what were the tools? What oh. were the methods? I just. Horrifying. A little bit horrifying. <laughs> yeah. I know. And we, in a tiny show and tell a while back, we, I, I think one of the stories I brought up was sort of the, the first amputation that was ever possibly right. done. And they think that was about, I believe, 30,000 years ago, which is, again, what were you using to do that amputation? Um, yep. So this kind of ties back into what I was saying about trading, because Greece did a lot of trading with Egypt, where about a thousand years before then, there's also evidence of brain surgery, brain removal. And actually, the tour guide that that showed us these ruins was saying maybe they were exchanging notes. So I think I think that's another thing is that, at least for me growing up, going to school, I was learning about ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, and there was never this discussion of, oh, actually, they might have been exchanging a lot of ideas, um, including totally. skull surgery. So <laughs> I thought that that was kind of cool. The less positive take on being at the center of so much meant that a lot of people wanted what Greece had. So there was this constant destruction and rebuilding you know, for centuries and centuries, really millennia. And that, of course, has impacted what ruins archaeologists have been able to find. And on top of that, Greece, particularly the islands, have experienced these extreme events like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. So my next little science-y thing <laughs> is talking about Santorini, which is the other Greek island we visited on our trip. So about 3,500 years ago, there was a massive volcanic eruption. And when I say massive, I mean it. I think... Some estimates were saying that its power was the equivalent of 40 atomic bombs, um, making it 100 times more powerful than Pompeii, which was this event where the ancient Roman city Pompeii was caught off guard with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and that was in the year 79. So this was about 1,500 years before that. And this volcanic eruption split Santorini from two pieces into five. Um, oh, wow. And our tour guide actually told us that researchers think that that split happened in a matter of maybe four to five hours. I mean, like how terrifying is that to have an impact that big that all of a sudden an island splits into pieces in a few hours? Sorry, can you remind me when did you say this happened? Yeah. So this happened um, about 3,500 years ago. I think it was wow. around 1500 BCE. That's technically a long time ago, but also really not that long ago at all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We went to see these ruins on Santorini, this settlement, right? So um, it was known as the town of Akrotiri. There are these two or three story buildings that were buried under ash, and they were discovered accidentally about 60 years ago now. They've actually only recovered a very small portion of this ancient city, and they have not recovered any bodies. Huh. So why? Well, unlike Pompeii, it seems like the volcanic eruption potential was building. So you had these um, earthquakes leading up to it. And they know this, at least in part, because they found the imprints of bed frames when they uncovered the site, and they were outside of the homes. And I didn't Whoa. think about this, but in places with lots of earthquakes, people people do that. They sleep outside because, you know, they'll drag their beds outside so that they're not injured if part of their house or things in their home fall down because of the earthquake. And so the thought currently is that people waited out the earthquakes for a bit and even considered doing some rebuilding based on these piles of rocks and other construction materials that were found outside their homes. But then things got worse and worse. Akrotiri is close to the water, closer to the volcano. It's not where you would have wanted to be. But like I mentioned, you know, this was a, a really intense volcanic blast and it covered the whole island in ash. It's thought to have killed thousands of people, but the skeletons are buried away, like way underground. Or the idea, the, the thought is that a lot of people are swept away by a tsunami that would have likely followed the eruption. So it's it's truly apocalyptic. And then on top of that, there are lava bombs, which are also <laughs> called volcanic bombs. So they're partially molten rock. Um, they can be a variety of sizes. The ones that I saw were huge. And these are at the Akrotiri ruins. They found them in the excavation. 
And these lava bombs are actually all around Santorini. You wouldn't know because they kind of just look like these weird big boulders. Um, Hmm. The ones I saw were maybe four feet across. So just imagine that falling from the sky. Oh, my God. So what is a lava bomb? Um, It's formed when a volcano ejects viscous bits of lava. They're shot into the air. They cool and they become an igneous rock. Igneous rock is just another word essentially for a rock that came from cooled magma or lava. And so mm-hmm. I will put a little video showing that rock on my Twitter account um, the day that this episode comes out, which is November 16th. You can find me at Sam J Science if you're interested in seeing that. Now let's talk about something a little more relaxed than lava bombs, um, which is the beautiful buildings on Santorini. So if an influencer posts a picture from Greece, <laughs> I would bet that it is taken on Santorini with the white buildings that have those blue domes. Santorini is stunning. Those buildings make it look, I think, even more picturesque, just kind of overlooking the water. So let's talk about that color for a second. Why the white and blue? Well, the white is a simple whitewash made of mostly lime, which is from limestone, and water. So it was really easy to make and it was cheap. Lime is also a disinfectant, so it has some antimicrobial properties. During the 1938 cholera pandemic, people were mandated to paint their homes that color to disinfect water that was being collected off of roofs and hopefully cut down on disease spread. I do not know how much that would have actually made a difference. Um, I don't know how likely it would be for cholera to spread that way, but, you know, it probably didn't hurt. Um, And then the blue was really just easy to make. You could add a pigment to the whitewash. In the mid-1900s, it was mandated on many of the islands um, that you had to paint the roofs blue. Was that for, like, just aesthetic consistency? Yes, it's the Greek flag colors, yes. Oh, right. um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, But today it's no longer law, but I think it's become such a look for the island. And it looks great, and so people have just kind of kept it. That is so interesting, though. I never heard the cholera thing before. That's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I... I thought that was so interesting, too. And another side note, I guess, is that because it is so dusty from all that volcanic ash that's still on the island, um, (laughs) they actually repaint those buildings almost every single year. Oh, wow. Like they have to because they get so dirty. So wild. (laughs) Okay, last thing. Feels impossible to talk about a trip to Greece without mentioning Athens. <laughs> so mm-hmm. when we were there, we, of course, visited the Acropolis, where there are a variety of monuments and structures. Um, and I would say at the Acropolis, the one that people seem to come from far and wide to see is the um, Parthenon. Mm-hmm. The Parthenon was built between 447 and 338 BCE. We actually went to the Acropolis, including the Parthenon, with this awesome tour guide. His name's Orestes. If you're listening, planning a trip to Greece, and you want Orestes' contact info, let me know. I'll put you in touch. He's an awesome tour guide. The thing I want to talk about are the Parthenon columns. They are made of pentelic marble, um, which has this beautiful golden hue to it. It's a marble, which means, you know, it's made of calcite, which is also known as calcium carbonate. And it also has little bits of quartz in it that give it a little shimmer. It gets its name from where it comes from, which is Mount Pentelicon, but they say sometimes Mount Pentelis. I'm going to have you listen to a short clip from Restus talking about this marble. All the uh, monuments are over here, the Parthenon plus the uh, Erechtheion, and I believe most of the uh, other stuff around here was made out of uh, best quality marble stones from the mountain Penteli, some eight, nine miles outside Athens. Okay. Uh, the ancient Athenian masons used the, uh, that kind of marble stones in the 440s, 430s, 420s for building the Parthenon and the Erechtheion and the other great monuments uh, st- still standing on the Parthenon. The thing is that uh, that kind of um, uh, special Marble stone has the the special uh, feature of growing in space when it's extracted from the living rock. Once it's taken down, it still uh, expands for about one to two millimeters, give or take, maybe, uh, for about 10 to 15 years. Uh, And this is why the uh, wooden beams inside the uh, columns would be preserved forever, airtightly sealed, uh, since the um, uh, marble stones would grow, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah, that's so cool. 
I'm going to look up exactly why they expand. Do you know off the top of your head or I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Don't worry. That's my job. I'm supposed to Please look into it. Please do and inform me because I am not a geologist. Yeah, so yeah. I'll, yes, the, absolutely. The other piece <laughs> of the story. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Most welcome. So... I did not figure out the science. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I could not figure it out. So I talked with of course a bunch of chemists, but then also some of them new geologists and they just did not know. One of the ideas that that one of them had was maybe it has something to do with the fact that it's more compressed before it's actually pulled from the bigger rock that it's in mm -hmm. and then it's able to somehow expand, but then they had all these questions about Does that mean the chemical structure is changing? What's happening? And I should say, it's not a temperature, humidity dependent thing either. It's just gradual expansion, apparently, over about 20 years. Hmm. So I debated even mentioning this because I couldn't find the science. But then I thought that maybe it's a cool opportunity for anyone who might know anything about this to let us know because we are I'm so curious I don't know if you're curious to but I'm curious I because I would like someone to know the answer yes <laughs> and to yes, tell us it's driving me crazy I spent so much time trying to track this down I couldn't so please help me I'm losing my mind and Orestes was mentioning that because it expands you have in these columns you have wooden blocks and so when they were doing reconstruction what I think is really cool is that when they were kind of taking apart these columns to try and put things back together they were smelling pieces of wood from thousands of years ago that were trapped in this marble which is just kind of i don't know i think it's just so cool to think the last person who smelled this was on the planet thousands of years ago and now i'm the next person who's sort of opening this up and mm -hmm. it's like getting a, a a whiff of the past that's it i'm i'm ending on a mystery i feel like we need to come up with a prize for anyone who can get back to me and let me know <laughs> what is happening Why does this pentelic marble expand over the course of a couple of decades after it's pulled from the ground? Yeah, if you know, email us. Yeah, tinymatters at acs.org or send a message to Deboki or I on Twitter. Okay, Deboki, I'm so excited. Yeah. Now that I've rambled, I'm so excited <laughs> to hear about your trip throughout Norway. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna leave the uh, the balmy atmosphere of Greece for some slightly <laughs> colder weather. Um, so as you know, but our listeners might not know, I'm currently living in Oslo, Norway, for a few months. My husband's on sabbatical; he's visiting at the University of Oslo. And coming into this trip, I was a little bit familiar with like Scandinavian and Nordic life. I'd studied abroad in Copenhagen when I was in college, so there were some things that I was sort of ready for, like dark winters are coming up. Things are a little bit more expensive. The public transportation's pretty functional. Like all of that I was like kind of prepared for. But also when I studied abroad in Copenhagen, like I was still in college and I'm, I'm just generally like more of an indoor kid, you know, city girl kind of person. Like I spent that time really more enjoying the city life than kind of exploring more broadly. But I guess especially now, I'm a little older. I can't necessarily enjoy the city in the same way because it hurts the next day. You know, coming out of lockdown too, um, I've been appreciating hikes in the outdoors a little bit more than I used to. I would not call myself an outdoors person, but I'm slightly more of an outdoorsy person than I used to be. And that's me in Norway kind of kind of an interesting place to be right now. Uh, I remember like my first day I was here, I was just scrolling through TikTok as you do. And, you know, I was starting to get exposed to what Norwegian TikTok was going to be showing me. <laughs> and one of the things that kept coming up in those TikToks and that like, at least at that time, were kids talking about how their parents would always make them when they were younger, go for walks if it was nice out, because in a place like Norway, you have to appreciate the sun when it's there. Like if it's there, mm. then you got to go for a walk. Like You got to <laughs> appreciate that. And I don't know how universal that is because like it's just TikTok. But like there's a lot of ways that I feel like that kind of thing feels emblematic of what a lot of Norway has felt like in terms of my experience, um, in terms of just appreciating the outdoors a little bit more and just like especially because the outdoors here are, are pretty cool. Like it's pretty neat. And so I'm going to talk about that in terms of two stories from my travels around Norway. And I'm going to actually start with the thing that's more recent, which is a trip that I took to Western Norway to the city of Bergen. And just apologies to all of my Norwegian speakers. <laughs> um, I, I've 
tried um, with like the pronunciations, but I know that I'm very far off. Um, But I was in Bergen um, like a few weeks ago. We took a train from Oslo to Bergen and it's considered to be one of, at least from what I had heard, one of the most scenic train rides in Norway. And it was gorgeous. It was like around six to seven hours. At times you see these gorgeous lakes, other times more farmland. Other times you're like going up a mountain and you get to see like all of the snow and like these kind of like icy glacial looking kind of areas. Very different than my experience riding the the metro in D.C. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very different. Like so beautiful. And then you like eventually come back down the mountain and you're like in Bergen. And we also got really lucky. So th- one of the things that our tour guide told us and that I checked later is that on average, it rains 227.1 days every year in Bergen, which means it rains most of the time yeah. there, right? But we got really lucky. We got like two really great days of weather. Like it was pretty sunny, pretty nice to go out. Um, And that was great. That was super nice for us because we decided to go on a fjord cruise. So what is a fjord? If you visit Norway, this word comes up a lot. And I embarrassingly kept using the word fjord all the time being like fjord, 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 but not really knowing (laughs) what it was. And uh All I kind of knew is that it involved water, but I sort of thought of fjords as sort of just like weird shapes of land. But really what fjords refer to are the long, deep channels of water that make up a lot of the the coastline of Norway and actually of other places as well. Um, And they're surrounded by steep cliffs. And these these channels of water, they're also really narrow. And so basically what happened uh, is that at some point, long time ago, glaciers carved out the land. So they just dug out all of this land and created these really, really deep bodies of water and these just really, really cool channels to go through. And so uh, there are a lot of fjords that you can visit in Norway. And we just took one of the, the fjord cruises that was really close to the city of Bergen. And it was just really cool. Like the the cruise has both, you know, you can stay indoors if you want, which is nice because once you go outside, the, the boats are usually running pretty quickly. And so it is super windy. There was a point where I thought my hat was going to like fully fly away. I think my glasses almost came off at one point. Um, but it was so worth it because there are these, these cliffs are just so steep and magnificent. Yeah. And my favorite thing was seeing like all the trees that are just growing along the side of them. I don't even understand how trees can fit on that little kind of like bit of rock. Like what are they growing on? What are they yeah, where are their latching roots? onto? Yeah. yeah. But they've they've figured it out. And then you can also see like how these these crevices like kind of start to form these slants, which I'm guessing like is over time maybe they've sort of eroded in a weird particular way or there's just something shaping their direction where it forms like these really really interesting patterns at one point we saw a bridge that was part suspension bridge but also part floating bridge because Mm. the fjord is actually too deep for them to build the supports like at the bottom of the water wow which was really really interesting so the water is pretty far below the cliffs it's it's quite far down you're saying Mm -hmm. um but then in addition it's also very deep. It goes yes. really, really far down. Okay, that's so, that's kind of, it's awesome. Kind of creepy for some reason, but so cool. Yeah, yeah. apparently. So I, we didn't like learn any of this, but I just learned this from researching later. Apparently there are actually coral reefs in these fjords, but what? I think because of the depths, it's like, we don't really know that much about them, but it's just crazy to me because that that, yeah, that water is deep. And I think you get to a point where it's so deep, like you're you're dealing with a lot of water pressure if you're living down there as well. Yeah. Like I, I want to know what it looks like in that water. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there are people who have filmed it and I will have to like go look for it now. But it's just it's so neat to see how how all of that has interacted over such yeah. a long period of time. Yeah. So that was our trip through the fjords. And so I definitely, if you're ever in Western Norway, um, I mean, if you're in Western Norway, it's probably to go see a fjord. So now I have the second part of our trip, which is actually, it came before the first part. Um, I wanted to talk about the fjords first because I feel that's so fundamental to to Norway um, and to the geography here. But I also wanted to talk about the stars. Um, But first, basically, 
this trip, this part of the trip was to Northern Norway, um, to a city called Bodo. And I know that I'm spelling that, or I know that I'm saying that incorrectly because one of the O's has the slash through it. And I just cannot get (laughs) the um, emphasis correct. So one of the things that was most exciting to me about Bodo is that it is the furthest north I have ever been on this planet. I think before maybe the furthest north had been maybe Reykjavik, but this is now the winter. I have never been more north than I have been. And this is also my first time in the Arctic Circle. The reason why I went to Bodo was not for any like legitimate scientific enterprise. It was to watch my husband's favorite soccer team play against their team, um, which has been doing really well, um, despite the fact that Bodo is actually a very, very small city. It is so small that you can actually walk from the airport to the city center. Uh, we did this when we were, were traveling. It's really nice because you don't have to worry about when you're going to catch the bus or like an Uber or any like anything like that. You can just you can just walk to the airport. It's very, very convenient. At worst, it's a little bit cold. Um, But it's actually not that cold because the other thing that's a little bit interesting is um, a lot of that part of Norway or a lot of Norway is warmed by the Gulf Stream. Um, Hmm. So it's cold. It's not like super comfy, but it's definitely not as cold as you might think if you're thinking like, hey, I am in the Arctic Circle. Huh. So we figured while we're there, we're going to, you know, we're going to go watch the soccer game, but we should also take advantage of the fact that we're pretty far north to see some northern lights. So for the, for people who are not familiar with exactly what the northern lights are or aurora borealis, northern lights are what happens when particles like charged particles from the sun hit the earth's atmosphere at these really really high speeds and as they get to earth, our magnetic field actually d- directs those particles towards the pole. And as they're moving, the particles are interacting with molecules in our earth's atmosphere, so stuff like oxygen and nitrogen and they're exciting those molecules and then those molecules are getting relaxed and that emits color that emits um in this case a lot of times what you'll see are green like that aurora borealis green that taylor swift was singing about that is charged (laughs) that's like charged particles interacting with oxygen that's not necessarily what she cares about but (laughs) that is that is what's (laughs) going on and so technically like the northern lights are happening a lot of the time it's just a matter of being able to see them so like all of us in the U.S. or most of us in the U.S., like maybe if you're super far north, you might be close enough to the pole where you're going to start seeing that activity. But otherwise, we're just we're a little bit too south. And also, we've got city lights. We've got all of that stuff. It's just not super common. But as you get more and more north, the northern lights activity is a lot more visible. It's just a matter then of like, is the weather good and stuff like that. So basically to maximize your chance of seeing them, you're going to want to go somewhere north. You're going to want to get away from city lights. So we booked a little Northern Lights tour. Um, We had this guy named Ivar who was absolutely uh, wonderful. And basically his job was to help us try to find the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights are happening. It's just a a matter of whether or not you're going to really hit the right probabilities of being in the right location. So that's a function of both the solar activity, but also like things like weather, like are there going to be clouds and stuff? And so we were a little unsure if we were going to be able to see them because it had Mm -hmm. been raining um, a bit the previous days. It had been pretty cloudy, so we weren't sure. And a lot of these tours, they actually have to have a cancellation policy because of that. Like they'll kind of have a sense ahead of time, like, you know, if the weather's like been rainy there's no point in going out like you don't want to be out at midnight when it's raining and you know that your chances are pretty pretty minimal of getting to see anything right but we were cautiously optimistic because that day it was actually not raining it was actually a little bit clearer like we could see the sky we could see blue during the day so we were like maybe maybe we'll get lucky so yeah Ivar congregated with us and this other couple who are also um, they were also there for the game, um, but they were and then they were also there to see now like, hey, maybe we'll be able to fit in some northern lights. And so Ivar basically explained to us what we were going to do to hunt for the northern lights. And this involved a bunch of different websites that have different models and different information that will hopefully would hopefully point us um, to, to the best place to look for northern lights. And based on the information we had for that night, it seemed like we were in a good spot, at least as far as clouds go. The The wind was moving the clouds away from us. It didn't seem like we were going to have to worry too much about that. 
he did tell us that there have been times where he's actually driven his tours to Sweden to go look for the oh Northern Lights, which I guess is not that far when you're in Northern Norway. But I was like, oh, man, I did not realize that going to another country was on the possibilities for how we were going to do this. So one of the other things he showed us was a model from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, which has basically probabilities for where you'll be able to see aurora borealis within a certain time frame. And it uses things like solar wind velocity and magnetic field information. So we kind of had a sense that, okay, the weather is good. Now we kind of just got to hope for some changes in that in that magnetic field activity. So we went on a drive to different dark spots to see if we could see anything. And it was really amazing because you know, it's so dark and we're at such a different latitude that I'm used to that you see the constellations from just like a completely different angle that wow. like, at least for me, it was like, it felt like seeing the Big Dipper from a completely different angle because you're just, because yeah. you are, I mean, you're at a different latitude and it's so, it's so bright. Like the city that we're near, it's, it's so much smaller. The light pollution is just nowhere near the level that I've gotten used to you know, living in other places that I've lived in. So you just, it, it, it's just so cool to be able to see the night sky like that. And so we were there for a little bit. Then we drove out to a secluded beach, which I mean, it's a beach, but <laughs> it is pretty cold and windy. So we waited there for a little bit. And I am like 20 to 30% sure that I saw a little bit of Aurora action there. Like, I think <laughs> I saw like a few stripes of green, but then it was just a little too cloudy. And I think it was there, but I couldn't get any pictures of it. So I don't know for sure. So we we kind of just kept going from dark spot to dark spot, hoping we would get lucky. And then we did get to a point where it was like, we knew that the, the, the magnetic activity was changing and we could tell that it would be maybe like in an hour or two that the activity would be perfect. Like if we just found a dark spot, we would be able to see it. The problem that happened is that it started raining. Oh, no. That was a huge bummer. Um, Ivar was such a great guide. He took us to all these spots that even though it was like so dark at the time, the next day we actually kind of, my husband and I did our own little trip uh, revisiting those places to see what they look like in broad daylight. And it was really cool um, to see like this secluded little beach and <laughs> this peak. And like we actually went on a hike around that peak area and went further up to be able to see all around the city and to be able to see the islands that were in the distance. So so cool. it, it did end up being a really fruitful tour in that regard or a or fruitful hunt, because even if we didn't get to see the Aurora Borealis like we hoped, we did get to see a lot of areas that we like realized later would be fun to revisit in that way. Sorry you didn't see it, but it does sound like at least you had a lot of fun on the hunt and you learned a lot about what the Aurora Borealis actually is because... Yep. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it, it's a green thing in the atmosphere, but yeah. yeah, it was interesting revisiting to, to talk about it today, like revisiting these websites that we had been using. Cause in the moment I was just like, I trust Ivar. I trust that he means that if this graph shows me this, then that's a good sign. I believe it. Yeah. That's really cool. I also do appreciate that you got a Taylor Swift Midnight's reference in there because that's also a very exciting thing that happened while we were both away is that Taylor yes. Swift dropped an album. So yeah. yeah. Midnight's <laughs> came out while I was in Bergen. <laughs> I woke up at 6 a.m. to listen to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. It sounds like you had a really fun trip. Now I also have uh, sort of an itch to see the Aurora Borealis. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this special episode of Tiny Matters, a production of the American Chemical Society. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Sam J. Science. And you can find me at okidoki underscore boki. And if you have any questions for us um, about us, about the podcast, about science, we're hoping to do a Q&A episode sometime in the next couple of months. So please send us an email at tinymatters at acs.org. And uh, see you next time.